the book of Ezekiel. Getting real close to finishing out this fifth chapter of the book of Ezekiel. I don't think we'll get through it tonight. So there's probably at least one one more Wednesday evening service. Maybe maybe two more. Been looking at. Jerusalem's punishment. Two weeks ago, we saw that the punishment comes from God's sore displeasure, and he was sorely displeased with them because of their great iniquities, because of their sins. Last week we looked at the thought that their punishment would be public as their sins were before all for all the world to see when when they should have been a testimony to the world they should have seen the light, the light of God through Israel and Judah. But they were not a light. <laughs> they took part in the practices of the world. In fact, they did worse <laughs> than the nations round about them. And that was the basis of God's sore displeasure, his being angry, his being furious with them. Tonight we take a look at the thought that their punishment was to be very severe and grievous. Just as their sins and iniquities had infuriated, had sorely grieved God, his chastisement of them, his punishment of them, was going to be severe and grievous. It, to, it was to be as has not been done before, nor ever shall be. Automatically, your minds are probably going to a great event that is yet future. Turn with me to the book of Zechariah. The book of Zechariah. In chapter 14... Verse 2. Well, we can read verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. I've looked at some commentaries, and 
on this, and they're varied on what that day is pointing to. Most of them are, have it pointing to the Roman destruction, when Rome fell upon the city and destroyed the city and took cap captive and all there. There's reasons why that doesn't fly. And verse 3 is one of those reasons why that doesn't fly. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the earth, or north, and half of it toward the south. You see, it's obvious that he's talking about at the end of the tribulation period. And, of course, the tribulation period is, is all the nations against Israel, against God's people Israel. Turn with me to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew in chapter 24. In verse 21, well, let's read, uh, uh, begin with verse 19. And, and woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither in the uh, Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to uh, this time, no, nor ever shall be. You see, the great tribulation period, and especially the end of the, that tribulation period, is going to be such a time as never has been, nor, nor, nor ever will be. Now, yes, the Babylonian conquest was destructive. And it had to have been discouraging to Judah and to Israel. And yes, the Roman conquest had to have been discouraging to see their city destroyed and the, the temple destroyed and hasn't been rebuilt. But those acts of happened in past and to that extent in past but there's coming a day during the great tribulation that there never has been a time like it equal to it or like unto it and there never will be after that I got a problem with the mid-tribbers because they act as though well, you know, we're, uh, the first three and a half years that, that's going to be a tolerable time no, that's a designated time as the great tribulation and you and I don't want to live through that time it's not going to be a time pleasant we think it's, it's bad now Well, w once the Holy Spirit's called out, no longer here. He's the one restraining. What's the time going to be like? There's things that are going to be uh, set into place that first three and a half years that aren't going to be pleasant.
And of course, then the last three and a half years is the worst of it. Part of this prophecy in Zechariah talking about the time of the two prophets in the city and half of the city taken away and, and, and the other half is, is, the, is the remnant the re residue <laughs> is according to the election of grace but we see that this prophecy that we have, this which Ezekiel is to portray in the fifth chapter, and, and, and the judgment of God upon them, wasn't, wasn't completely fulfilled during the Babylonian conquest, and it wasn't completely fulfilled in, in Rome, and it won't be completely fulfilled until the time of the great tribulation it is because their sins were more and greater than those of the heathen those that they called Gentiles those that they, they called dogs her punishment is going to be relative to her crime. It was to be and is to be greater than that of Sodom. Now you keep that tucked away in your mind. Israel's judgment, Israel's punishment is to be greater than that of Sodom. And we get in our minds that, 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 that Sodom, and the sin of Sodom was wicked and evil. Yes, it was wicked and evil. <laughs> but as we go through this, you're going to find that spiritual adultery is evil and wicked. This is what Israel is being punished for. Because she went a whoring after other gods. Turn with me to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 4. In verse 6. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom that was overthrown as in a moment and no hands stayed on her. He said, it's greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom. And Sodom was overthrown in a moment. Look how long since God told Ezekiel this and Ezekiel was to portray it. Look how long it's been. And we're not yet to the great tribulation period. We're not yet to the end of what God said will be upon them. There, natural affection is to be abated. Let's read verses 9 and 10 of chapter 5. And I will do in thee that which I have not done, and whereunto I will not do any more the like, because of all thine abominations. I've not done it, and I'm not going to do the like of it again. Because of all thine abominations, he says, 
What they did was abominable. And I might add, if we're guilty, it's abominable. These are things were written for our admonition, for our learning, for our examples. Verse 10, Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments in thee, and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into all the winds. Their natural affection is abated. I mean, they, uh, this is God's judgment on them for their, their great abominations, for their great sins, for their great iniquities. Uh, in studying this, I in so many ways see a parallel of our times to, to this verse. Not that fathers and mothers and children are eating their fathers and mothers eating their children and their children uh, eating fathers and mothers and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, literally, But children are being swallowed up by their mothers and fathers, and, and mothers and fathers are being swallowed up by their children. You think about that. It's a lack of natural affection. Family ties are supposed to be some of the closest upon earth next to relationship in the Lord's church. They had willingly broken their covenant with God. And God was going to break the bands of their strongest natural affections. You think about that. And I trust everyone here loves their family members deeply. There's strong bonds there, strong ties there. And then just to all of a sudden have that abated. This was foretold. It was said it would be. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy in chapter 28. And look with me at verse 53. He says, And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons, and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. That happened. Remember, remember the encampment around the city and, and having the city shut up and the great famine? And because the hunger was so great and, and, and food wasn't to be had, they ate one another. They ate their children. Their children ate their parents. So that the man is tender among you and very delicate, his eye shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he, hath, whom he shall eat because he hath nothing left him in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee in all thy gates." The tender and delicate woman among you which would not adventure to set 
the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness. Her eye shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her son and toward her daughter. Unthinkable, huh? And toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet and toward her children which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness therewith. Thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. It tells us that it will be because of, because of the famine, because of being shut up, because of lack of food. Look at verse 64. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wood and stone. <laughs> and they've been scattered among the nations. Oh yeah, Israel's a nation since 1948. But look at the host that are still scattered among the nations. Have not gone back to the land yet. Then in verses 12 through 17, we have the complication of God's judgments. Let's read verses 12 through 17. A third part of thee shall die with the pestilence and with the famine. Shall they be consumed in the midst of thee? And a third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. And I will scatter a third part into all the winds. And I will draw out a sword after them. Thus shall mine anger be accomplished. And I will cause my fury to rest upon them. And I will be comforted. And they shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it in my zeal when I have accomplished my fury in them. Moreover, I will make thee waste and a reproach among the nations that are round about thee in the sight of all that pass by. So it shall be a reproach and a taunt and instruction and an astonishment unto the nations that are round about thee when I shall execute judgments in thee in anger and in fury and in furious rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken it. When I shall send upon them the evil arrows of famine, which shall be for their destruction, and which I will send to destroy you. And I will increase the famine upon you, and will break your staff of bread. So will I send upon you famine and evil beasts, and they shall bereave thee, and pestilence, and blood shall pass through thee, and I will bring the sword upon thee, I the Lord." have spoken it. God's arrows. Do you ever think about God's arrows? God's shooting arrows? These aren't arrows of blessing. He calls them evil arrows. In other words, they're bringing, they're bringing his chastisement upon them. He, they're bringing his punishment upon them. Think about this. There's no escaping them. In fact, uh, uh, of the evil arrows, I, I think the sword... might be the most merciful. Well, with the exception of the remnant. But you think, you think about the way one-third of them is to die through the wasting away because of lack of food. 
We don't, we don't know what it's like to, to starve to death. We've been raised in a land of plenty. <laughs> I remember times I didn't always have all the food I wanted or the kind of food I wanted. But I always had food to eat. I always had something. And now we have more than enough. And even in our great plenty, it's not necessarily what we want. <laughs> You don't know what I'm saying about. But if we want it bad enough, we hop in the car and we run out to Walmart or up to Publix and get it. <laughs> the sword would be a quick death. That's why I say probably the most merciful of those that die. Those that die by the famine, by the pestilence, that, that would be a horrible, slow death. Near like unto cancer, wouldn't it? But I want you to think about this. Verse 17. He said, I, the Lord, have spoken it. What does that mean to you? And by the way, everything that we read in here, do we have to have the Lord say, I, the Lord, have spoken it? For it to mean something to us? Wow, no, pastor. <laughs> well, sometimes we act that way, don't we? Well, that doesn't say the Lord spoke it. <laughs> well, do we believe this is the Word of God? Or do we believe, as some people do, what well, contains the Word of God? No, this is the Word of God. Amen. His Word is sure. That is it. He'll stand, and that which he's spoken, he'll bring it to pass. <laughs> Turn with me to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 19. In verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord, notice this, the testimony of the Lord is sure. That is, the word of the Lord is sure. How sure? Well, he's spoken it. Look at, uh, at the 111th Psalm. And Verse 7. The works of his hands are verity, that is truth and judgment. All his commandments are sure. That is, you, you can count on it. They're sure. And one of my one of my favorites. I mean, I, I got a lot of favorites in the Word of God. But Hebrews chapter 6. You had to know I was going to go over there talking about this. Verse 18 and 19. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. It is steadfast. 
The word of the Lord is steadfast. He cannot lie. If he spoke in it and it didn't and it was not steadfast, it did not he did not bring it to pass, then he lied. And he will not lie. I go against his nature. I go against who he is. He is God and we need to know that his word is sure. Whether whether we like what it says or not, his word is sure. And it's going to be our judge. It's going to be our judge. Another thought is evil pursues sinners. Evil pursues sinners. And the curse shall come upon them. And it shall overtake them. The judgment of God, the punishment of God, the chastisement of God shall, shall overtake us. And it shall come upon us. Back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter uh, 28. Again. Deuteronomy 28. Look at verse 22. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning and with the sword and with the blasting, and I th there again, I, I think the sword is, is the most merciful here. And with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. <laughs> In other words, they're going to overtake you. They're going to get you. Verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed because thou hearken not unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which he commanded thee. Israel had all this from the book of the law, from the books of Moses. We can read in the New Testament where they put great stock in Moses. But they didn't place enough stock in what Moses had to say to them from the Lord. <laughs> oh, to, to God that we'd not be as Israel and Judah. Oh, to God that we would take stock in his word, that we would look at Israel and Judah and, and see the example that they are to us, to not fall into the same condemnation that they fell into. In the course of this, we've told you that Yeah, our eternal destination is settled. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but what kind of life do we want to live here? What kind of life do we want to finish out our days? And he that, that is obedient to the word of the Lord shall be blessed of the Lord. And he that's not obedient to the word of the Lord shall suffer curse. Shall we stand? Be dismissed in a word of prayer.